Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sandton Convention Center here live from Johannesburg. My name is Alexander Leipner from CNBC Africa, and it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all this morning. On CNBC Africa, I'd also like to welcome all our viewers across the continent on Africa's biggest business and finance television network. It's great to be here. It's the second of a series of roadshows uh, that we are putting together in the build-up to the Intra-Africa Trade Fair, which will be hosted in Egypt in Cairo later on this year. Uh, and uh, it'll hopefully be an informative session for all those in the room and for all of those watching this morning um, and to get a bit of a sense of uh, what is to come and to discuss a very important topic of intra-Africa trade, uh, which is uh, something that has been uh, on the agenda for a long time. But I think it's a, a question of how do we now activate it? How do we action it? How do we get the continent trading with itself and also with the rest of the world? And how do we make that work in the most optimal way? SATIP and the African Continental Free Aid Trade Area is an idea whose time has come. Not just to meet the pressing needs of the current generation of Africans that is characterized by a very youthful and fast-growing population. The, indeed, the success of this initiative may herald a new era, an era of collaboration and healthy and constructive competition. We as Africans, we need to embrace competition as one of the core foundations that drives innovation. Competition is not un-African. It is a lack of collaboration that is un-African. May we use SATIP as a new platform to deepen collaboration. I wish this launch and this SATIP initiative success. Thank you very much. It is also interesting to know that Africa's combined share of global value chains remains at around 3.2%. South Africa's share of that is 0.6%, and that's almost 20%, by far the, single, the largest for a single African country. It's also too interesting to note that South Africa generates over 12% of its GDP from franchising a figure that exceeds the success of Australia and even the United States of America. There are names like Pick and Pay, Quick Feet, OBC, Postnet, Nando, some of whom are represented in this audience today. It is no wonder that South Africa has the largest share of intra-African trade of around 25% of total intra-regional trade, with the highest contribution in terms of imports as well as exports. In addition, South Africa also has the highest number of African companies with revenues of more than $500 million per annum. Based on this solid foundation, ECIC, whose mandate is to facilitate and encourage South African export trade and participation in economic development projects abroad, and Afrexim Bank, whose mandate is to promote intra and extra African trade, came together and designed SATIP, which is being launched today in an initial amount of one billion US dollars. Know that this effort will support also the implementation of the African continental free trade area and also the heightened political enthusiasm for regional integration across the continent. The question we need to ask ourselves is, if the developed half of the world is dependent on us to get their raw materials for manufacturing, how is it that we are still poor and cannot compete in international markets? The answer is very simple. We have not been able to use what we have in abundance, which others do not have, to strategically and pragmatically position ourselves for what we do not currently produce. Sub-Saharan Africa faces three big challenges over the next generation. It will double its population to two billion by 2045. 
By then, more than half of Africans will be living in cities with all that that means. And this group of mostly young people will be connected through mobile devices, properly harnessed and planned for. These are positive forces for change. Without economic growth and jobs, they could prove a political and social catastrophe. All systems of patronage and modeling through will no longer work. I'm Godfrey Mutizwa. I have with me here a panel of gentlemen who will help us to understand why Africa has not been able to trade as much as it should have been able to do uh, across uh, the continent. Before we begin, I wanted to begin, first of all, by giving you something to think about. Did you know, if Africa were a country, it would hold the record for the longest economic expansion uninterrupted in history. It is true. The country that holds the record currently at the moment is Australia. We're talking about 27 years. Before that, it was the Dutch, the Netherlands, I think. But Africa, as far as I was able to dig, hasn't had a recession as a continent. That is the technical definition of a recession. Two recessions of uh, negative growth. But what have we done about that situation? Very little when you look at uh, how our economies have been trading and the fact that we have not been able to trade with each other. The numbers have been given. I don't want to bore you with those numbers. What I'd like to do is to ask the gentleman that I have in front of me to explain why we have not been able to take advantage of our good fortune. Let me begin with you, Dr. Orama. And I would like from you, sir, if you can give us just the key things that have been holding Africa back in terms of an ability to be able to sell products to each other. Africa has a checkered history. Uh, the history of colonialism uh, is at the heart of the problem Africa faces today. Colonialism was built on a well-crafted strategy, the strategy of divide and rule. If you read the work of uh, the former French Prime Minister Abbas Sarrao, you will see that this was done very, very carefully. So that uh, strategy succeeded in not only partitioning Africa politically, but made it impossible for Africans to deal with themselves. That is why today the lack of trade information is the biggest challenge to promoting in traffic and trade. Many people will say, and I repeat this every time, they say infrastructure uh, is a problem, is the biggest constraint in traffic and trade. But what we say at our present bank is that lack of adequate infrastructure is a problem, but it is a generalized problem. It's not specific to in traffic and trade. The, today, the stock of African infrastructure can carry about $1 trillion of Africa's trade. Why is it that intra-African trade share of that is just $120 to $150 billion? Why is it not $300 billion? Why is it not $400 billion? It is because a, an exporter in South Africa does not know uh, what a, a buyer in Nigeria needs. South Africa, for example, imports certain kinds of leather at double the price that it is produced elsewhere in Africa. Consider Kenya and uh, Burundi. Kenya imports from New Zealand. The leather uses to finish its, um, the, the, the shoe industry uses there. Whereas Burundi exports the same type of leather at half the price. It's just the problem is that people don't know what is going on. <laughs> and until we solve that problem, yeah. we are not going to be able to move in traffic and trade. Okay. 
I've been making notes, as you saw, and I'm going to come back and talk about uh, some of those notes that I've been making. Let's get in the opening comments from uh, the other guests. Let me go to uh, Mr. Kutwane Kutwane. From a South African perspective, clearly South Africa is a big player in the intra-African trade already. However, as Mr. Orama points out, the capacity for this intra-African trade is there, but it's not being utilized. And you've got to ask the question out of the big brother, how come we've been unable to take full advantage of what we have before we begin to talk about expanding? Uh, if you look at uh, the way our trade has been going, it actually follows what Dr. Tr uh, Orama said. Uh, it followed uh, the traditional colonial routes where it was much more comfortable for South Africa to trade with uh, you know, the likes of the United Kingdom, then Europe, the US, et cetera, et cetera. And we have seen uh, recently, over the past 10 years, more of South Africa's trade uh, being with uh, the, the, Asian, the, the Asian big, as I call them, uh, the Chinese. Uh, however, we have also seen a steady increase in South Africa's role in the intra-African trade. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, currently would probably be staying at around 25-25% uh, or so. Uh, and unfortunately, 90% of that, or close to 90%, is within the SADC region. So effectively, uh, and if you look at the population distribution, yeah. SADC is just quite a very little area to be trading in, 300 million about. people. And you are having about an estimated 1.2 billion Africans on the continent. Why would South Africa then, or South Africans, not uh, you know, explore those outer markets outside Sarak? Mm. Uh, some people will say it's because of uh, that uh, element of infrastructure that uh, Dr. Orama touched on. Sure. Uh, I think that, I mean, in my experience, infrastructure has always been a major, uh, 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 I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, a major stumbling block, really. And uh, that's why, as ECIC, we have been uh, quite active in the facilitation of funding for infrastructure projects across the continent. Yeah. However, that may not only be the, 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 the only problem. Yeah. Uh, one of the other problems that uh, you have is a lack of information and lack of knowledge, as Dr. Rama has alluded to. I'm going to come back because I think I've got an answer. I don't know if you like my answer, though. <laughs> Mr. Chahana, let me come to you. I suspect you are one of the culprits. <laughs> because you are in that sector that we Africans like to bash. Absolutely. That sector that makes us go to Dubai when we want to go to Lagos. That sector that <laughs> says to us, if you want to travel to Harare, you must pay the same fare as the same amount of money that you need to pay when you go to London. Sir, so, from your perspective, what are the impediments to facilitating greater movement of goods and services and people within the African continent. I think let me, let me start firstly from the, the, the basic fundamentals of, of trade, as I know it. I'll put it in a very simplistic way. People trade when, there's a, when you have something that I want, then we can trade. And if the conditions permit that, the, the price, the logistics, everything work, then trade will be facilitated. So it's about supply and demand. At the, at the, the most fundamental thing is that African economies uh, by far have relied on, on underlying commodities and by far the countries have what each other, ha they have the same thing, whether it's, it's in mining and so on, with very little beneficiation. Now, the moment we start to look at the, the demand factors and understand that Africa has demand, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in manufacturing, if you talk about textile, there's their, their opportunities, there are opportunities there. How then we facilitate those sectors so that the demand can meet supply sure. becomes a very important thing. And I think Africa hasn't, hasn't worked that uh, in a very, very succinct way. If you talk about agriculture, for example, in most countries, the production is quite fragmented, a small herd of farmers, but with no aggregation layer that really lends itself to export in a much more uh, structured way. So I'm starting from demand and supply that we need to fix. Once you have dealt with that, it goes to the issue of the signaling, the information sharing. With technology, with digitization now, with mobile penetration, there's a lot more improvement in terms of access to information and we should see improvement. But we need to address the fundamental issue of supply and demand. Right. Once you have gone through that, you talk about logistics, ease of movement of goods. We have to make sure that people in Africa can move easily across the continent. 
What it is today by far is that the connecting, moving people from one country to another, you have to go through a hub outside the continent, yeah. whether it's from a pre previous colonial country or the new hubs in the, in the Gulf area. So we have to facilitate that. Air traffic, air transport networks have to improve. We, have to, we need to invest in that. There has to be sustainable airlines in the continent. Air cargo is going to be the intermediate kind of intervention whilst Africa builds into Africa rail networks to actually get to large scale production. So limitations of course is around making sure that uh, the rules of flying into each country are actually opened up and the single African air, trans air transport uh, market agreement signed in Addis the past couple of months creates a first green shoot of opportunity. Yeah. What we therefore need as an airline industry in Africa is to underpin that with investment in a sustainable way, tying in tight partnership. There will be no winner take it all. If we are approaching it that way without going for partnership, Africa will be underserved. People will, be, will struggle to move from one country to another, and goods will not move from one country to another in a manner that supports inter Africa trade. So policy frameworks need to improve, investment right. in airport infrastructure must increase, yeah. sustainable models for airlines through yeah. partnership must be what we as executives must adopt. I see where you are going, and I like that direction because it ties in with part of my uh, tricky question that's going to come back later. Mr. Gumede, say, you only see opportunities when you look around you because you are a man who looks for business. From your perspective, what have you found the most frustrating thing when you look across the African continent and you want to get into uh, certain places? As a traveler, I can tell you one of the most frustrating things that you can ever do is to try to go through to Africa through Bide Bridge. Do not, for the sake of your health. From your perspective, sir, the most frustrating thing. Uh, maybe it's better to start on a positive note. <laughs> and, and, and I just want to uh, compliment both uh, uh, Dr. Ofrana and uh, Kutuane for having done what uh, this man on the right and uh, the Honorable His Excellency Obasanjo and uh, uh, President Mbegi tried to do when they launched NEPAT. And it has taken us a long time to get where we are. And, but I think it's a good start that we have that finally Africans are doing something together for the benefit of the continent. And, and, and obviously, this initiative comes at the back of the frustrations that we are talking about. But for me, where I see frustration, I see an opportunity. Sure. So as, as an entrepreneur, you know. If and, they allow and, you, though. <laughs> and, 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 and for me, I think the issues that uh, we, we spoke about of uh, policy certainty, I think that is really the impediment of growth. That is what makes us entrepreneurs to be wary of investing in countries. But we've got to understand that uh, in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, the awakening of China uh, just got most of our African leaders in government to believe that all the problems of Africa will be sorted out by the Chinese. But the Chinese have been very good in becoming like lions, kill and keep, <laughs> for the day that they are hungry, you know? And uh, I think they've been able to use their economic muscle to go and determine the future of countries, sure. in particular focusing on the resources. But where we lack as Africans is access to capital. You know, as they talk about China being a giant, the Chinese have not yet financed one African businessman to invest in anything. And yet we applaud the fact that they come into the continent and they do business for themselves. They don't do business together with African business. Because the issue that Dr. Farmer referred to of colonial mentality is what is perpetuating some of the challenges that we have, that you'll find an oil company having an evergreen contract of supply of fuel in a country. And you have to understand that if the price of fuel is high, it affects everything else. Mm not just food, not just human development, but in particular education, because everything becomes very, very expensive. Mm. And one challenge that we have as African business is dealing with banks that are 
Afro-pessimist. We see it here in South Africa. And uh, we are comfortable, or most businesses are comfortable dealing with Anglophone countries. When it comes to Francophone, they say, no, 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 no. Mm. That is not for us, it's for France. Mm. <laughs> you know? In Africa. And, and yet, if you really look at those French-speaking countries, they are also endowed with minerals. Yeah. They have infrastructural needs that is the same, but because they've got uh, uh, minerals, they need it more than some of the countries. Yeah. And that is where, as South Africa, where we have human capital, we have access to finance, we can really go in and help those countries to industrialize. Mm. Because I believe one of the challenges that we've had as South Africa, and uh, we used to talk a lot with uh, Minister Ale Gewin, is the best way for South Africa to help Africa and help itself mm. is only when we export our business people to go and industrialize other countries. Mm. The days of saying everything must be bought from South Africa mm. is not going to fly because it's the same mentality of colonial powers that they've had many, many years ago. Mm. And I believe it's only now that we all are grasping the opportunity to understand that what will stop people coming into South Africa yeah. as economic uh, 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 refugees it's if we go and invest in those countries. Sure. And uh, with South Africa under uh, Minister Alec, <coughs> Mozambique was coming out of a civil war mm. under President Mandela. And the best way to move back the millions of Mozambicans back to their country was to get South Africa to go and invest. And we built a smelter plant. Mm. I don't know if you remember. Um, <laughs> and, and as well as making sure that we help them to unearth the landmines sure. and take some of the South African farmers mm. to go and start farming in, in Mozambique. And that's what led to people going back home to, uh, to Mozambique. Today, there's no visa requirement between our, our two countries. Sure. But unfortunately, when you go and look at the economy of, of Mozambique, for South Africa, if we want gas, we must go to Brazil we must go to Italy, we must go to India, we must go to China uh -huh. to ask for a gas allocation. Yet sure. we're there because we don't believe in helping each other and working right. together. Yeah, and I think your answer and all the answers that I've gotten from the other gentlemen are pointing in one direction and deliberately. I left Minister Erwin last and I still continue to say Minister Erwin, and I just discovered you're also calling him Minister Erwin, so that's okay. Once a minister, always a minister. <laughs> <laughs> we know you are wearing another hat, but I want to tap into your other hat that you had for such a long time when you carried such distinction. It appears to me that it's the politics that is hindering greater movement. Dr. Rama spoke about it when he spoke about uh, the beginnings. And he spoke about it when he spoke about the difficulty of uh, exploding out of Southern Africa into, into the rest of the continent. And Mr. Hanna did, and they've just done so. Sir. From your perspective, Mr. Erwin, how is South Africa positioning itself and ensuring that it's able to take full advantage of uh, the opening that we have seen out of the African continent? Also, from a politics perspective, how open are African leaders? The Africa Free Continental Trade Area has been open now, and yet I think it's just three or four countries that have actually ratified it. Why do the politicians ever move so slowly? I'll answer with three points. One is the importance of policy for industrialization. Uh, the second, which has been stressed here, is industrialization in Africa will only take place if we build partnerships. I'm going to say a bit about that. It won't if we don't. We must just understand that perfectly. And thirdly, I'll, I'll say a little bit about how the free trade agreement and industrialization need to be harmonized. So very briefly, South Africa's industrialization, people, very few people understand its history. This didn't just happen because we had gold. In fact, in most cases, gold would have prevented the industrialization because you get this Dutch disease phenomenon. So it was very far-sighted thinkers, the most important of whom was a Dr. van der Beyl who started in the 1920s to systematically implement policies. So, but they did it in a very interesting way. 
they didn't do it just by the state. They set up companies. So Iscors, Eskims, Harbors. Then they realized that they had to move to spread the industry. So they set up the Industrial Development Corporation. That was in 1943. A very successful funding operation which brought in the textile industries, most of our agro industries, all funded by the IDC in that period. Now clearly there were also political circumstances of isolation, but South Africa's industry ha has been supported by policy consistently. If you were to take the very unusual situation of an auto industry, why would you build Ford and GM in South Africa? Now there were a whole range of reasons, but partly it was those, that government that realized, let's get them to come here. Mm. And the South Africa has had an auto industry policy from 1925. And we're going to renew it right through to 1930, 2035. So the point I'm making with that is that industrialization requires clever and consistent government policy. And in Africa, that's definitely a major weakness. Sure. But we now face a new set of challenges that Robert's been talking about. We've got these giant industrializing economies, India, China, etc. We've got the America, Brazil. So for South, in Africa, if each economy tries to industrialize, they won't. They're just not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So we have to begin building the value chains, the investment across African economies. And it requires thought, it requires planning, and it requires consistency. For South Africa and the rest of Africa, it's a mutual advantage. South Africa cannot expand its industrial capacity only on its own eco economy. Mm. We have to work with growing African economies. The quicker we can industrialize Africa, the quicker both benefit. And when you think about it, Africa is the single largest opportunity on the globe. Why? Because we've got the least developed infrastructure. So industrialization is fundamental to us. Building the infrastructure, building the the, the vehicles and other things that will use that infrastructure, building the machinery and equipment for agro-industry, for all sorts of things. So this is a massive opportunity. We as South Africa would be absolutely stupid, in fact we would betray our peoples, if we didn't realize that South Africa's industrial future is about partnerships with Africa. The last point I'd make is that we must sometimes be a little bit cautious. I'm very much in favor of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Right. But I've also got a golden rule. The developed countries always tell you what to do now when you're developing. They tell you what they're doing now. They never tell you what they did to develop. And I promise you they didn't develop with free trade. So we've got to put together both the free trade agreement mm -hmm. And a systematic agenda for industrial policy and industrialization. So, sure. and for that you need complex programs. So, we I'm very pleased that this initiative is up. Yeah. Delighted with this initiative. See, this is the kind of financing that you need to assist the industrialization process. Yeah. Sorry to say this, but due respect that you've done it, it's taken too long. <laughs> <laughs> but you've done it. <laughs> and now we've got to move. <laughs> that's the important but thing. It won't work, and that's why I gave you the example of the IDC. The IDC was so successful, not because it just went out there and funded the right project. It funded the policies that had been put in place by the governments. So what you need is collaboration between the governments. Sure. We, we are exploring, I think, a very exciting possibility. Yeah. Collaboration to build the most difficult thing in the world, a motor car. We should collaborate as Africans to do that. Not a new car, the ones we got. But that requires very careful policy, yeah. very careful cooperation, and fundamentally, the last point I want to make, we will not industrialize unless we set up partnerships. Dr. Arama, I'd like you to respond to Mr. Ewen. What we live every day in our Ferguson Bank, uh, but I want to add a few things just to support uh, what he's saying. Um, if you look at the trade statistics of South Africa and compare it with the one of China, yeah. 
that is the trade relations between China and Africa and between South Africa and Africa, you will see that in 2001, South Africa's exports to the rest of Africa was slightly above $4 billion. China's exports to the rest of Africa was slightly under $6 billion. Not much different. By 2015, China has been able to grow its exports 18 times to $108 billion. South Africa was only able to grow its by only five times to $23 billion. Manufacturing value added at in 20, uh, 2001 in terms of proportions of GDP was not much different. So in terms of the industrial base, South Africa had what China had. Yeah. South Africa was is in Africa. China, there's no road between any African country to China. So I, I don't want to say that because there's no road between South Africa and Kenya. That's why South Africa did not export. Nah. We have the sea. Nah. Yeah. And Chinese use the sea. Yeah. The problem is that we did not have these instruments that the Chinese had. China's port import bank was heavily empowered. China Development Bank was heavily empowered to support their exports. We did not have that kind of thing within Africa to help us trade more with ourselves to create the partnerships that the Honorable Minister is talking about. And that's exactly the question that I wanted to put yes. to you as you were responding to the Minister, because I wanted to ask you, you're in a unique position where you see the kind of strategies that all these countries are pursuing as they try to industrialize, as they try to export to each other. Are you seeing the kind of partnerships the Minister is talking about developing across the African continent, within the national geographies themselves, before we talk about the regional plays and the continental plays? That's what you're saying. Um, it's only recently we started seeing it. Uh, we've seen a commendable growth in intra-African investments. Uh, and intra-African African investments will grow their partnership. We've not had that kind of thing before. And again, for various reasons. Yeah. South Africa is in a very good position, but South Africa, South African businesses uh, historically have been extremely mm -hmm. risk averse going into Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, they were not as adventurous, uh, uh, if, I can, if I use that word. Going to Africa, find people they can work with and take the expertise in Africa to build uh, the kind of businesses, the manufacturing capacity yeah. that Africa so needs. Because, come on, look, look at it this way. Uh, China exports about $60 billion of light manufacturers into Africa today. This is a potential market for South Africa to capture. Even as China moves away from it. China is able to do that for various, using various means. If South Africa builds the kind of partnership that the Honorable Minister talked about, factories and uh, manufacturing capacities can be developed yeah. in many African countries to be able to produce these same things. And when those factories are produced, you build the supply chains mm. that will continue to grow in traditional trade, continue to grow South Africa's trade with the rest of Africa. There yeah, I go again. If only Africa were a country. Imagine. <laughs> Mr. Kutwan, I want to talk to you about uh, your billion dollar opportunity, which is great. But I wanted to talk to you about the difficulties of moving out of, from Southern Africa into the rest of the continent. The challenges. What have you found so far? Yeah, I mean, um, we spoke and also of, feel free to respond to the yes. other points that have been raised by the other participants, by the way. Yeah, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have spoken about uh, the issue of uh, information availability. I think one of the things that this program intends to do is also to do advisory yeah. and to do capacity building so that uh, South African exporters can be 
uh, aware of the opportunities and also to bring those opportunities back home. Uh, be aware of the opportunities that exist beyond their comfort zones. I mean, I say that this, uh, with all due respect. You know, most uh, South Africans think that uh, sometimes the world of trade finishes uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Zambia at the most DRC. <laughs> uh, but it goes beyond that. And uh, I think, I mean, you know, I have always said that uh, as ECIC, we have uh, concentrated a lot on the mining projects in the continent. Yeah. Uh, it's only recently that we have uh, started increasing our infrastructure uh, programs or projects that we are, we are supporting. Uh, because we have noticed that, uh, you know, uh, we are really perpetuating the, the, the same traditional things. I mean, look at the landlocked countries like, uh, for example, DRC. Uh, probably the train will leave and uh, go to the harbor in, say, uh, you know, in Kenya, yeah. or probably further down in Bera or if you are a Malawian, some uh, uh, of the populations there, they don't actually even know what that truck is carrying or what that, uh, you know, those carriages and those containers are. Yeah. Uh, they don't even know it's copper. They just see these things are moving. And we say there is no infrastructure. But, you know, the movement it's of nice. these things are actually geared towards, uh, you know, export. Getting the to stuff the, out. And it is all commodities or raw materials. Sure. So the whole issue really of... Uh, regional integration. It goes beyond each country trying to, as I think the minister said, trying to say, yeah, we want to do beneficiation of our raw materials. I mean, because it's going to perpetuate the same story. Mm -hmm. You do beneficiation, some little value added, and then uh, uh, Zimbabwe does the platinum, South Africa does platinum, mm -hmm. and then we all export. We mm -hmm. don't export to each other for the other to actually sure. do further processing. So I think those are the kind of things that, I mean, when the minister was talking about the yeah. policy yeah. alignment, I think I, I should actually have emphasize the policy alignment right. and the harmonization of, uh, uh, say, trade protocols among these countries. Yeah. I think, I mean, you know, by now, uh, politicians have been speaking since uh, probably uh, since I was born. Uh, uh, about, you know, the need to build the United Africa and the need to, all, all these kind of nice things. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we are not uh, short of plans. Yeah. Uh, plan over plan over plan. Uh, last time we were forming uh, trade blocks and, uh, you know, being jealous that, uh, you know, another country, say, you know, uh, Tanzania is joining Isadak and then yeah. is joining yeah, uh, Eastern Africa and is joining Comesa. You see, those are the kind of things you know, we wasted yeah. time dealing yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, at the moment, you know, we also, you know, are talking about, and I think it is the most comprehensive one, the yeah. uh, interregional, uh, you know, trade, free trade area, the African uh, 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 continental uh, free trade uh, agreement that has been signed. But yeah. I mean, I also agree with Minister Erwin that unless you underpin this by concrete programs yeah. of action, and that uh, have got milestones, uh, like what we are trying to put up together here with Africa in Bank. Yeah. Uh, then you are not going to realize the advantages of that. Then the next time you will be uh, naming it something, yeah. agreement for free trade in Africa. <laughs> so you will keep on you know, tweaking and doing all these kind of things, but you will never get there. Like the dog chasing its tail. And I wanted to tell you as well, talking about getting old slowly, I can tell you when they started talking about the Inga Dam in the DRC, my hair was not white. <laughs> I can tell you without a shred of doubt. Here we are. Still talking about the Inga Dam, and the Inga Dam is still not providing power to Africa. So you are trying to do a practical. You are trying to provide a practical solution right. through Satip. Yes. Talk to me very quickly about what you are doing. That will make a difference to what you are already doing. Yeah, I think we have also uh, identified that uh, to successfully undertake uh, trade amongst each other, there is a need for trade finance. As, as, as in Africans, okay. yes. There is a need for a trade financing uh, uh, product. I mean, let me just put uh, some figures together here. Um, currently, Africa has got a trade finance deficit of over 100 billion US dollars. And we are talking about the start, which is $1 billion, and which is targeted specifically at South African businesses to be able to do what I, was, what I mentioned earlier. Sure to get access to the markets beyond their comfort zones. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, I think Dr. Orama will be launching one in, in East Africa, and then in West Africa. And then, you know, it, it has to replicate across. Mm. But then, uh, as we say, 
the small we will always be defeated because, I mean, then Kenya, perhaps it, he, will, he will do it in Kenya. Yeah. And Kenya will say, no, now I'm promoting my own exporters to actually export to the rest of the continent. Potentially. And uh, by the way, when you go to the rest of the continent, you are specifically going to individual small countries with different policies, different uh, regulatory regimes and yeah. everything else. Yeah. And sooner or later, a South African exporter is going to be very frustrated. Mm. So that integration itself had to be underpinned by dealing with the policy integration, mm. integration at the policy level True. and the, the commonality of views in terms of where we are heading. I mean, we must be speaking the same language, yeah. not uh, the same language as, you know, you know, we, 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 in South Africa at the moment, we speak one language, hopefully. <laughs> uh, so in that context, we should be able to speak one trade language. We yeah. want to trade yeah. in each other. We want to invest yeah. in each other's countries. Absolutely. For instance, you know, people talk about competitive advantage uh, or com 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 comparative advantage in trade. Yeah. In Africa, that should actually be so obvious mm -hmm. that as a South African, you know, if I find that... Uh, 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 SAA, I'm being hit so much by uh, maybe labor protest, uh, you know, action and the likes. Yeah. And I'm told that, I mean, in Malawi, I wouldn't have that. Obviously, it will be cheaper for me to relocate sure. to Malawi sure. uh, 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 <laughs> uh, and, 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 and produce much cheaper where I won't be hit by prolonged uh, labor action. Yeah. But that does not, I mean, I'm, I'm not what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, without basically saying that we should underpay our people. Sure. But we should look for those kind of competitive uh, right. advantages, uh, uh, advantages uh, so that, I mean, there can be alignment at the end of the day. Mm. I mean, maybe if I'm a worker in South Africa, I'll say, no, look, I mean, now industries are closing, but they are opening in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Maybe I should also, you know, reduce my demands. So that's how the world shapes sure. up. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Kumede and Mr. Chahana, I'm giving you the same question. Are you going to profit? Are you profiting from SATIP? What advantage do you see SATIP making in your lives as business persons in your, in your different industries? We can begin with Magmeda and we come to Chahar. Chahana will talk of the passengers that are utilizing SATIP. <laughs> 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 uh, but for me, I think uh, this really puts us on par. And uh, I know in terms of comparing what China and what this is. It does put you on power with the Chinese? It does, in a way. Because it gives us a ticket to the game. You know, a billion dollars is a number uh, that we can use to get to the game. It's our World Cup, you know? Because in the past, it's been very difficult to access funding. I had to go out to the Italian a, a credit facility to raise close to a billion dollars. And their condition was I needed to partner with the, Chi with the Italian company. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that we're competing headstrong against the Chinese. Until today, touch wood, in the projects we've been involved with, we have not lost to a Chinese. Sure. Because once you have access to cheaper financing, all of a sudden, the Chinese financing is second to our financing. And I expect that through this program, it will galvanize South African companies to go and compete against the Chinese. Because we must understand that the Chinese funding process takes long to digest. Right. And this will give us nibble food to be able to move with speed. Yeah. And, and address the challenges and the opportunities that are in front of us. Yeah. Obviously, uh, Dr. Roma and Kutuana hope the paperwork won't be too long. Awesome. You know, when Kanayo was <laughs> explaining, I was saying, gosh, all the challenges of Africa can be sorted out and the opportunities because there are plenty. They are just waiting for enabling environment yeah. of providing cheap finance, yeah. but quicker. Absolutely. You know, when, when you talk about paperwork, I'm reminded of uh, the, that story by, uh, uh, I think it was Whitey Basson, when you were CEO of ShopRite, when you spoke about the mountain of paperwork that's required to export into the African yeah, continent. Sure. But I also wanted to talk about another South African icon. I don't know how many in the room remember Avenge or know about Avenge, the company. Avenge used to be one of South Africa's biggest construction companies. On Friday, that share was going up like a yo-yo. And someone said to me, no, don't worry. Avenge is now a penny stock. Why is Avenge now a penny stock? 
because of some of the troubles that it encountered on the African continent, mm -hmm. in part because of the absence of the kind of guarantees that you are talking about that will be available to South African companies now going forward. So hopefully, sir, you will revive our venge. I will be watching you. <laughs> Mr. Chahana, do you want to respond? Yeah, I, I think if, uh, if, the, if the work of South uh, continues the way it's geared to work, it's going to grow African economies. There's a very clear correlation between air travel as well as GDP, or GDP of nations. Sure. As that improves, we sh the airline industry in Africa should pick the upside. I must haste to say, though, that there's a lot of work that we need to do in the aviation sector specifically stitching together our capabilities across the continent in a manner of tight, strong partnership to facilitate ease of movement. And uh, whereas policy is critical to give cover, but its most, most important part is pragmatism of business leaders to actually force the system to actually respond to the market demands. Right. And these are the kind, this is the kind of attitude we're adopting as I say uh, today in terms of our outlook for Africa. Sure. I want to throw the kid amongst the pigeons, Mr. Erwin, coming to you before we open the debate to the floor. Um, is nationalism causing us some problems here? In part, in very simple solutions that could sort out some of the problems that we have. Because I am sitting in Zimbabwe. I want my Air Zimbabwe to be flying. I don't want South African Airways to be coming in and picking Zimbabweans. Where do I put my flag? Is that causing us problems? Do you want to answer can that? You can, can answer that? that. He can answer yeah, it. Yeah, can I pick that? Because Everybody can come in. I think it's that the, from the aviation sector, that's exactly the, the issue. And my sense is that we have to find modern business models that take into account national aspiration sure. as well as commercial viability. I hear you. So I have no, no issues with any of the countries having their own flag carrier as long as stitched together commercially in a viable way. That talks about partnerships. So these things can be done without any of the countries lose, lose. Because remember, a flag carrier does represent national aspiration. So you, you can't kill that. But we as executives must find commercial models that are within the right competitive policy to actually make those airlines viable yeah. through tight partnerships, stitch them together to render a service horizontally, at the same time meet national aspiration yeah. without breaking the competition law. And I think this is the kind of areas we have not explored. That's why most airlines are not viable in Africa. It's because mm. it's my tale and the scale is not there. We must bring scale within a competitive framework. Yeah, that's and I why, think it's doable. That's why Emirates is eating our lunch. Absolutely. Mr. Erwin? <laughs> yes, I think there's a danger that nationalism often causes problems, particularly in these more But I want a solution of how we overcome it. And the, the, in the more complex of the industries where it's unrealistic. So I'm going to tell you an anecdote which I heard personally from the chief exec of Lufthansa. Lufthansa was bankrupt in 1993. And they went to government and said, bail us out. And government said, no. So they had to fight from the bottom. But they introduced the concept of an alliance. So as Vianne is saying, the existence of Air Zimbabwe may not in itself be a problem for Africa. It may be a problem for Zimbabwe if they don't join an alliance. So I, I'm delighted to hear what he's saying. The weakness of the African airline sector is there is no proper alliance that would suit Africa, because the co our air traffic is going to be slightly different, freight is going to be much more important, mm -hmm. smaller regional systems. Mm -hmm. So we could learn a lot from what Lufthansa did, because they realized that there was nationalism, Air France, BA, Iberia. So they got round the problem with a very clever partnership. Sure. And, and that's what we got to do. It's the same Could with auto. Do? Everyone wants an auto industry. Yeah. There's not auto industries uh -huh. in every economy of the world. Yeah. You've got to come up with a clever partnership. But the partnership is essential. And if I may just also, sorry, a last point. I was delighted to hear the products you're going to put up in this. That's the first time I've heard a more varied set of products that meet Africa's needs. Most of the time, the product doesn't meet Africa's need. Where we're starting things. So when you're starting things, you need that kind of assistance for analysis. You need risk underwriting. You need guarantees. These are the sort of things. So mm -hmm. if you can get that provided mm -hmm. fast and partner with the big corporations of Africa, yeah. you'll move this thing much more quickly. Absolutely. So I was delighted to hear, don't make it bureaucratic. Yeah. 
If it's bureaucratic, people get angry and go off elsewhere. So you've got to make it work smoothly. But the, part, the, the, the range of products you're offering, for me, that's a wonderful, it's, a, it's also a, a solution to our problems, which is really yeah. Let's uh, get to the floor. Let me start by calling out uh, Mr. Pimua from uh, 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 Econet to open up our discussions from the floor. I, I think what has been missing in this debate, which I was hoping to hear, is the, the power of ICT in leapfrogging Africa forward. Um, and, and I think in creating the comparative advantage that we require for this mass of young people, that Africa has. 65% of our population is below the age of 25 across sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and these, you know, I think as, as President Obasanjo said, you know, they could be our biggest dividend, uh, but they could also be a big explosion uh, in terms of social disturbances uh, if we do not harness them. So I think for me, from a, from a trade perspective, you know, it's, it's very interesting that our young people Today, if we were to call 10 young South Africans and look at their Facebook profiles and look at the other African friends which they have across the African continent, mm -hmm. it, it is amazing for me that my 13-year-old daughter has Facebook friends in Egypt sure. and has got Facebook friends in Senegal. So how do we harness ICT? Uh, because these young people are doing it. They are not waiting. Mm -hmm. Uh, for us to put these, these um, you know, very nice sounding instruments that we want to put together. Uh, and, uh, because these are the traders of the future. Yeah. Uh, the, the traders of the, of the future are not uh, you know, the gentlemen that you have on your panel today. They are not you and me. Yeah. Uh, the traders of the future that we need to ensure that they are educated in the new trading mechanisms. Mm. How do we build online marketplaces? Uh, in order to make sure that our young people are trading across the borders, because they, they really are the big bulk of the population of this continent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You make a very important point. I'm reminded, actually, of uh, uh, um, the latest edition of uh, uh, Forbes Africa, which has got Africa's 30 under 30. I tell you, if you have not looked up and seen those young men and women, you better do so, because it talks about the power of the youth, and it talks about ICT, and it talks about the physical breakdown of the physical boundaries that we have today. These kids are just going across. Is there anyone who wants to respond to that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's a very important point because ICT presents opportunity. We spoke, we, we spoke earlier on about the information arbitrage, the, the lack of relationships that needs to be facilitated. Uh, he makes a point to say the young people are already in the network that on its own creates a sense of connectivity across countries. Uh, the development of the digital industries is changing the construct of uh, economic zones and trade zones because digital goods are facilitated online and they, they know no boundaries per se. So digital is going to start challenging significantly the trade agreements in, in their current form. They need to evolve and start talking to these kind of developments. It's critical that governments continue to liberalize uh, policies around spectrum because the fortunate thing in Africa, a lot in the rest of the continent, a lot of investment in ICT is private sector driven, mm -hmm. which means there's private capital that's coming in. Sure. But we need to enable, we need to enable the continent through quick decisions around spectrum policies, but also creating opportunities for young people to create, uh, to create assets on a, on, a, on, a, on a digital platform. The, the, the last point I want to make on this, the opportunity for Africa to leapfrog its development, whether it's in education, we talk about youthful population, if we don't educate them access to content that's smart, they will not be educated. Instead of being a dividend, they're gonna be a time bomb. That's correct. So education key. How you transform healthcare, shortage of doctors, be able to use digital. Many countries like Australia is talk about digital health strategy. We're still talking e-health. It's, it's still quite primitive. So we have to embrace technology. Governments must lead there. All they need to do is to be agile in policies around spectrum, and private sector will invest in the content and enable the young people. Absolutely. It's a very important point. Sure. Mr. Ewan, you want to come in? You want to come in as well? Yes. Uh, we are using technology today to develop a payment and clearing platform that we hope 
will accelerate the traffic and trade. Yeah. Uh, because we know uh, that part of the problem, that's the reason why we have uh, informal traders uh, and why they are flourishing is because we do not have a means of bringing them into the formal sector. Mm. Today, many of them have a telephone. So if, if you create a payment settlement platform that allows them to use that device to trade, they will come into the formal sector. Okay. Uh, and if you okay. make it then possible that they can do the trade with their currencies, you are even doing greater service to intra-African trade. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things we are doing. Sure. Our trade information portal is also uh, hinged on technology. Mm -hmm. We know that the best way to deliver the trade information we need mm -hmm. is to use modern technology, mm -hmm. use ICT, because that is the only way we can reach as many people as possible and reach the new productive sectors that will increasingly become disaggregated. Mm, absolutely. Uh, Minister Owen, quickly if you can. Uh, very quickly. Uh, you know, I think we must use the continental free trade framework to have, as I said, a parallel uh, set of partnership agreements on industry. Mm. And right at the, one of the top ones I would put would be telecommunications. I agree absolutely with Vianney. The, the problem at the moment is far too many different standards, mm. different policies, mm. different approaches to mm. infrastructure. Mm. Mm. So that basically the infrastructure in the rest of Africa is still too weak to sustain a really big data system. Mm. We've got to think about that. So I, it, it's a key area. If we want to unlock uh, ICT and, and the fourth revolution yeah. for our industries, remember that we're not going to jump into a fourth revolution. We're still going to go through an industrial revolution in Africa, but we'll use fourth generation technology sure. to make that much more efficient than we've done in the past. Yeah. Sure. But to get that, we have to expand the infrastructure. An African telecommunications pact would be the biggest single inducement to investment in this continent. I'm convinced of it. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to thank our panelists for uh, some uh, top-level polls. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think what we have done is to touch really and uh, uh, just, you know, very lightly at the very top end. I mean, this conversation has to go on and it's got to get deeper and it will get deeper as we get into the other geographies where we're taking this conference, which of course is Nairobi, which is Cote d'Ivoire, and then we're also going to go to Egypt, of course. And so let's keep thinking. Let's keep finding solutions. Thank you for your time. To our viewers at home, thank you for watching us here on CNBC Africa Channel 410.